Stephen, can you tell us please about your early experiences working for bookmakers on the race course? Did you sort of do an apprenticeship as such? Not a formal apprenticeship, but um, after working for Noel Ray, um, you know, I was, used to travel around and well, then I moved back to London and used to go racing and uh, used to go to the races and just see if I could get a job for the day. And, uh, and that was a great apprenticeship because, um, you know, working for lots of different bookies, you know, I'd see how di different bookies would uh, operate. And uh, during that time, I formed the opinion that those who had opinions about horses didn't do, seem to do as well as the ones that uh, didn't have opinions. And I think that was what um, pu pushed me along that path of, you know, betting to figures and not uh, looking for winners. Um, I mean, other bookies I worked for, I worked for Lad Books for a year. Um, worked for a bookie from Hitchin called Bert Smoothie. Um, one of his favourite sayings was, never bet on anything that talks. Um, Eddie Baxter from the West Country, in Glastonbury, I used to work for. Um, yeah, and as I say, lots of different bookies. Um, you know, all over the country. I remember Eddie Baxter, from my days, he always was the first to price up. Was that the case when you worked with him? Yes, yes it was, yeah. So did he do his own tissue? Yes, yeah. Talking of Eddie Baxter, who I get getting on with Avalon, who I remember very well, um, he had a favourite saying, apparently. Yes, he always used to say that, uh, yeah, it's a common saying that you never see a poor bookie, but of course he pointed out that the reason for that is that when they become poor, they're not bookies anymore. You did mention to me when we weren't uh, filming that you made a living betting on photographs at one point. Yes, that was um, that was in the 60s. Uh, yeah, I realised that there was money to be made. Um, it was in those days it took a lot longer to announce the result. And, um, yeah, you could get to reasonable bets on sometimes. And... Uh, and not only, yeah, didn't make fortunes at it, but it was enough to keep me going. Uh, and apart from that, it was very good at sharpening me up because um, in those days, yeah, you didn't know how long you had. Uh, you tried to get as many on as many bets as possible. Um, you never knew when, where the price was going to pop up in the ring. Um, and they, the way they announce it, nowadays they say something like, here is the result of the third race. In those days, it was just winner number one, you know, absolute sudden death. So you really had to, you know, be on your toes. So did you have to nudge Alex Bird off his pitch? Was he still operating in those days? Uh, no, I think that was probably a bit after his time. So what gave you the edge? What made you sure that you were, you were more eagle-eyed than the judge? Um, well, experience. Uh, well, it wasn't a question of being more eagle-eyed than the judge, because uh, the judge had the benefit of the photo finish. It was just a question of, um, you know, standing on the, 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 the line, you know, really concentrating on, on what was coming up, not watching the horses uh, as they approached the line, but fixing your gaze on the line, and then running out as fast as possible to... And, um, trying to guess where the price would, you know, a decent price would pop up with the bookies. Now, I always think that your local course, Basel, a pretty deceptive angle. Were there any courses that you used to really like betting on photographs? Um, well, Ascot was a good one, because I remember once I managed to get an even £25 on with Victor Chandler when the result had been announced, because it was so... The, the angle was so deceptive, they just didn't believe the the uh, announcement. They thought the announcer had made a mistake. You never feel a little hint of guilt after that? Not at all, no. <laughs> no. Another, and this is another record which takes a, might, you know, unlikely to be beaten. I once got on a photo when the winning distance was 10 lengths. How long did you manage that? Well, that was at Newton Abbott. And as they were approaching the line, the jockey on the second was falling off. 
and nobody knew whether he'd fallen off before the line or after the line. But I thought that the one with the jockey on had won anyway, so I was quite confident to back that. And it, it transpired the jockey had fallen off before the line, and it was ten lengths back to the one that should have been third. Now I understand you've also got another unenviable record that you don't think you'd be beaten. You've you knocked out an eye-watering amount of money on, I believe, the Wokingham. And you didn't even lay the winner. What happened there? Yes, yeah, so I lost twenty three thousand on the Wokingham, and uh, yeah, just on laying each way bets. And uh, yeah, the clerk. I said to the clerk, "Well, John Durston, um, or oh, how did we go on that race?" And he said, "Oh, you lost uh, twenty three thousand." And I thought, "Oh, good job! I didn't lay the winner then. That would have been a lot worse." I think that's probably the most a bookie's ever lost on a race without laying the winner. So were the percentages for each way handicaps as bad in those days, or was it just pure bad luck? That well, it was just, well, I suppose bad luck, bad luck that the shrewd punters, uh, you know, chose to bet with me. Um, and there's another thing you were telling me that there's something that annoys you in modern times that not the the chap on the stool is not necessarily. The person that makes the decisions or provides the money. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the NAB used to have a very good rule that the the man whose money it was had to be on the stool taking the bet. And that way, you know, if a punter goes into a bet, he gets an instant decision on whether he's on or not, which is not the case nowadays. So is it particularly frustrating when um, you think you're on and then you're not because there's a steward's inquiry behind the joint? Uh, yes, it is. It can be frustrating, and uh, uh, and again, yeah, quite often the, the you ask for the bet uh, when the price is on the on the on the uh, light board, and uh, all of a sudden it's disappeared, and she so, and they say, oh sorry, no, the price has gone, when really it hadn't gone when I asked for the price. And something else I remember. This is just something that's cropped up in my mind, you must have been one of the first bookmakers to utilise a mobile phone for accepting bets on course. And if I remember better next to you at Taunton, you were sort of taking bets on the away meetings as well as the home meeting. Was that something that really took off? Yes, yeah, so I was only taking them from bookmakers because, yeah, the, the law at the time was you could take bookmake, you could take hedging money from off-course bookies and it was still tax-free. Um, and that could that could liven up the quietest day. You could be absolutely dead on the course, and then the day would come to life if a bookie rang up for a reasonable bet. So would they be the sort of bets that they wanted to actually hedge money, or would they be to shorten up, or a bit of each? Well, a bit of both. Now, talking of memorable days, Stephen, can you give us one or two? Well, one was probably Arkell's first Gold Cup, because the... Um, that was at the time when Arkell and Milhouse were, uh, yeah, both uh, yeah rivals for the top of the tree, and the, the build-up to that Gold Cup was tremendous uh, rivalry. Um, yeah, far more than the rivalry between Denman and Corto Star, um, and it, it was a great time to be getting interested in racing, really, to uh, yeah to see the rivalry between the two. And that was uh, the first, his first Gold Cup. Um, and then his third Gold Cup, uh, I was working in London at the time for Bertrand and Smith. Uh, somehow I managed to get the day off for Gold Cup. And I thought I'd like to go to Cheltenham. So uh, the evening before I cycled to Oxford and stayed in the youth hostel there. The next day I cycled from Oxford to Cheltenham before racing and after racing, cycled back to um, Hatfield, near Hatfield, where I was living at the time. And uh, that was the longest uh, distance I did in a day, about 150 miles. But I, I certainly knew I'd been for a bike ride by the time I got home. Did you avail yourself of any of the ones to tend to pay the X's? Uh, no, no, I was never a big odds on pumps or like that, unless, uh, unless, except on photos. How did Cheltenham in those days compare to these days? Well, it wasn't nearly as big. I mean, it was still one of the biggest meetings of the year, but it wasn't quite the big deal that it is now. I believe you had a bit of notoriety, as dare we say, a mean bookmaker at one point? 
Yes, um, Gus Dalrymple, who used to write, uh, write a um, sort of uh, uh, column, uh, amusement column in the life, he said he was f fed up with hearing, you know, who's the greatest boogie, who's the biggest and who's the greatest. So he thought, well, I'd like to know who's the meanest boogie. Uh, so I thought, well, I, uh, well, that's me. Uh, um, so I wrote in, and uh, of course I didn't put a stamp on the letter. You can't write in and say you're the meanest bookie and put a stamp on the letter, can you? So I, I started off saying, yeah, well, thank you, Gus, for paying the postage due, and uh, I think I'm the meanest bookie. And uh, so he came out, and uh, he came to Lark Hill with me one day, and uh, but he decided I wasn't quite mean enough to win the title of the meanest bookie. You didn't give him honours at the end of the day, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever honours are. Hey Steve, a bit like your career from the silver ring to the rails, um, you've just explained that you were labelled the meanest bookie, but you were also known as the bookie to the stars. So how did that transformation come about? Well, uh, very gradually. Um, I remember when I first started betting in the silver ring, we used to clerk in shillings. Um, because that was mostly, you know, a pound was quite a big bet, but that was going as 20, not uh, not one. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, but later on, Paul Haig once uh, described, he used to write in the, I'm not sure if he was in the Rising Post or the uh, Sporting Life, but he described me as bookies, bookmakers of the stars, which was probably a fair comment uh, at the time, I think. So which stars used to bet for you? Um, well, the, the big punters like Michael Tabor and J.P. McManus. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of trainers and owners, uh, which, yeah, made life interesting. Those sort of names have put a shiver down the spine of us, but he sure Yes, yeah. Um, now tell us a bit more about the Waterloo Cup. Because that, of course, now, of course, a sport that's uh, been outlawed, and obviously a passion of yours. You did it for quite a long time. Any particular memories of the Waterloo Cup? Any exchanges or events? Um, well, of course, coursing wasn't only the Waterloo Cup. Just as racing isn't only the Derby or the Grand National. Um, yeah, there were meetings, you know, throughout the winter. And the Waterloo Cup, of course, was the big one where all the good dogs would run. Um, but uh, yes, I very much enjoyed um, going coursing, and it was the one sport where I did have an opinion uh, because I had to. There was a lot of book, a lot of meetings. I was the only bookie, so I had to do quite a bit of homework um, on the coursing, and um, it was uh, yeah. There was a form book, proper form book for it which occasionally I, I uh, contributed to. Uh, if the regular correspondent wasn't there, I'd do a write-up on the uh, on the meeting. Um, but, uh, uh, and even for the Waterloo Cup, I, yeah, I did have to do quite a lot of homework to um, get the prices out. Um, I did, uh, I had a half share in a dog which uh, won the, not the cup, unfortunately, but won the purse, which is the uh, consolation stake for the um, first round losers. So that was the highlight of my dog owning career. Um, but it was, uh, um, yeah, coursing as a whole, I, I miss that far more than uh, being a bookie on the rails. So how many meetings a year would the be coursing then that you would attend? Um, well, in the winter, I might go to, you know, two or three uh, uh, a week. Um, and it'd be all over the country, including up to Scotland. And um, I remember there used to be quite a few Irish priests come coursing, uh, especially in my early days. And uh, one of them said that uh, I, when I was carrying the joint from field to field, because uh, unlike uh, the race course, it, it would be in a farm on yeah with absolutely no facilities be we'd be in one field for for an hour or so and then another the field for the next hour and uh, he i'd carry my joint from field to field and uh, 
this priest said, uh, I reminded him of um, Jesus Christ carrying his cross. <laughs> we know what happened to him. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, so, it, it, indeed, it was a heavy burden that I had to bear. So it must have taken some um, some pricing up, especially the Waterloo Cup, about 150 runners, were there? Uh, no, there were 64 runners. Oh, right. Yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, on, on a knockout basis over three days. So it'd be, uh, the winning dog had to win six courses to win. And yeah. at one time, you know, before my time, it was a huge betting event. And, uh, yeah, William Hill used to bet there just after the war, and uh, as uh, did quite a few other bookies. Um, Joe Coyle also, uh, he made his, partly made his name. He was the first off-course bookie to offer odds. Um, I think this, this was in the 1920s. He was the first bookie to offer odds uh, in London on the various courses. And uh, when I first went there, and this shows the march of technology, um, they used to get the results out. Uh, every, every three courses, um, someone would cycle off to a nearby house to where there was a phone um, to uh, you know to relay the results you know by phone to the to the uh, to Extel. Um, and I can remember when that, before I went uh, started going when I was at Beresford we used to have a ticker tape machine and the results would come over on that. Um, and then you know a few years after my first going, I remember a bookie turning up with a satellite dish and he was betting on uh, Hong Kong racing. And that, that was the march of technology. Of course, the, uh, the Sporting Life correspondent for coursing was no less than John McCrook. Did he used to turn up? Uh, yes, I used to... Uh, he couldn't drive, so I used to... He used to travel with me all over the place. Uh, we've um, shared many a journey <laughs> up and down the country to coursing meetings. You wouldn't take the Bentley to one of them, surely? Yes, uh, yes, so it's, it was. Uh, it performed remarkably well on soggy fields sometimes, whereas other cars would be you know, really struggling to, to make any progress on, on in the mud. You know, Bentley would uh, sail through it. Steve, I've had to turn the camera on again because you just told me a wonderful John McCrick story. Can you uh, repeat that one, please? Yes, we were up at uh, Altcar. Um, up in Lancashire for not not for the Waterloo Cup but for one of the minor meetings up there and um, he thought it'd be a good idea to go around and see Red Rum so uh, which was stabled at Southwater at that time um, so we went into this uh, huge stable and uh, but he was a huge horse and uh, I'm, I'm a bit nervous getting around near horses I don't like to get within kicking and biting distance of them and uh, all John could think of saying was that he was hoping that Red Rum would lash out and kill me because it would make such a great story. Red Rum kills book, Bell's bookmaker. <laughs>